it, it, it bizarrely, I mean, I've been prosecuting, I don't know, 15 years or so, and uh, I organized a conference on sports crime. Uh, it was um, a national conference, the first of its kind. And I was talking then, publicly all the press and media were there, and I said, look, the, the impact, the behavior, of the behavior of players on the pitch impacts on spectators, impacts on wider society. Now, is that stupid? I, don't, I, don't, I haven't done any research, but it sounded, it sounded about right to me. Uh, and you will not know how much hate I got after that. And I remember one, one letter in particular, Dear Mr. Ravzel, uh, we English invented football, please go back to Wogland. Uh, I remember looking at the globe and I couldn't find Wogland anywhere. Uh, but what I did find was a name and address the letter. And what I did do was report the matter and the police finally, uh, gratefully, took action, took action. So from my perspective, if you don't stand up to the bully, to the racist, to the person causing you harm or threatening you harm, then they think they've got away with it. And then they'll go on to the next person. Uh, and that was the message I, lesson, lesson I've learned myself over my career. And that's why it's really important that I pass it on to you and pass it on to anybody else uh, as part of the wider public. Because we can only deal with uh, the, the nasty side of society unless you, uh, you, you have the courage uh, to stand up yourselves. Uh, and we are here to provide all manner of supports available to you to get you through that process. It's not easy by any means, but nonetheless it gets you in a position where uh, we can tackle to kind of tackle these things, rather than simply allow them to fester. When I, when I um, moved to, to London in 91 now, and became a prosecutor, uh, it was very easy in those days, I'll be honest with you, the first decade, 90, we didn't have targets, measures, uh, performance um, just happened. You know, I'm sure the police will say the same thing, it was a case of, you know, well, do the best we can. Uh, but, you know, it's given it's public money we're spending, it's absolutely right that we measure our performance. You know, it costs, the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, costs every one of you, man, woman, and child, a penny a day. Now, it may not sound like a lot, but every one of you, <laughs> that's a lot. Uh, and my penny, your penny, has to have value for money. And that's why we have measures and targets in order for you to see what our performance is like and how we are improving, which we are. But, in the 90s, there wasn't any of that framework as such. Uh, and uh, we were in a position really of, uh, I was in a position personally of being able to do what I like. And I was very fortunate working in central London because I was able to deal with all these cases uh, and just hold on to them and do them myself. You know, there wasn't this, there wasn't a specialist terrorism division or a specialist uh, organized crime division in CBS. I could do more. And it was what gave me uh, the ability to learn. And so I, I dealt with all the very high profile cases. I dealt with various uh, celebrity type cases, I dealt with various um, international cases. You know, you probably read about international cricket corruption recently when you had uh, various uh, football bowlers being prosecuted uh, a couple of years ago. But I dealt with the one 12 years ago, which people forget. Uh, and that was the one where Hansi Kwanya killed himself. Do you remember he died in, um, allegedly killed himself? He died in a plane accident because he was suspected of, uh, of being involved in it. I dealt with that 12 years ago. Me, a little boy in London, you know, dealing with an international Pretty corruption, uh, and uh, and that was the, you know, my good fortune that I was able to deal with cases like that without really the supervision or not supervision without really the spotlight uh, that every single case that we have to deal with now uh, deserves and gets. And um, when yeah, I also recognise the power of the media. I, you will know this from your own, own experience, I guess, through mooting and anything else that you may do. But I didn't know this back in 1993 that actually what I said in court was going to be reported elsewhere, depending on what I said. It's really important how you turn the language, not just about the case, how you turn the language. I remember dealing with a case of a couple that had sex on a train between Margate and Victoria. And uh, they, um, uh, they were stopped only because uh, they started smoking in a no-smoking compartment. Uh, I remember looking at the papers before the hearing the next morning, because I knew they were going to be guilty. Uh, and I thought, that's really funny. <laughs> that's really interesting. Uh, and I so, you know, they pleaded guilty, I gave the facts, but I also made that point. I couldn't believe the impact it had. Time magazine had me as quote of the week, you know, and people were saying, how British! <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, the reality is, I, th I thought, I said that. I made up those words. You know, I didn't make up the, they were made, but you know, I, I articulated them. Uh, and then more and more I realised, actually, it's not just about, if it's your court, if it's the public's court, it's important that you have an interest in what's said and done. And therefore, more and more I would do that. And you know, we had, there was a fantastic court reporter back in central London 
sadly he's passed away now. And I remember sitting down with him once and I had this circus performer up uh, who'd been using swiping people's credit cards as they arrived to get their tickets and stuff. And he said, let's, let's, let's put in as many circus references <laughs> into your uh, opening speech as possible. And so I was talking about this ring of thieves and how he had juggled with the facts in the interview. Uh, literally, every newspaper the next day was circus, 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 circus. There you go. Yeah, I learned my trade that way. I learned that actually what, how you say something isn't as important as what you say. And in recent months, in recent years, on some of the very high, high profile, very complex cases I've dealt with, I've been very keen to work with the communications people that I have, the press people that I have, to use the right phrase. Stuart Hall I dealt with, you probably remember, BBC presenter, I dealt with him a few months ago, and I used the phrase opportunistic predator. And then everybody now calls him an opportunistic predator. Right? Copyright in Israel lifestyle, two thousand more than me. The point is, you can find a phrase, if you can, to encapsulate what's being done. People are very um, lazy these days. Uh, they don't want to read the whole 80 page transcript or 30 page judgment. They want it in uh, sound bites. They want it in a position that will enable people to go away and know what the situation is without having to read it all. So, uh, from my perspective, uh, I learned about the power of the media. I learned about, the, uh, the more importantly, the link I would have with the public in what I did. And so I went further. So it wasn't just about the media. So back in 2000, or 1999, I decided, let me go out to the public. You know, you all know this, the CPS, when it was invented in 1986, we were, we were created in 1986, because before that, the police uh, colleagues had the power to prosecute and investigate. And the Royal Commission decided that was inappropriate because there were regrettably some serious miscarriage of justice, going on six, or four, you may have heard of them, where you know, there was evidence that was, should have been disclosed but wasn't disclosed, and as a result, people went to prison that shouldn't have gone to. The Royal Commission said every civilized society should have an independent prosecution service, and so we came into being. Now, the word independent was misconstrued by the CPS in the early days, 86. They thought it was detachment. So they thought that they should be ex directory. You know, you can't ring us. <laughs> we can't go to the home, uh, only to our police colleagues, nobody else. And so from our perspective, we got that wrong. But we've learned. Now we're not accelerating by some, for some years, decades now. But you know, back in 2000, we realized it's important to get out. So talk to school children, talk to students, uh, to community groups, to vulnerable people. Uh, because they shouldn't have to come to me or to a police colleague. We can go to them. You know, I, I didn't realize how, people, how scared people are to come to my office. Why? It's only me for crying out loud, but you know, from a percep perceptual point of view, people work. So it's really important that I went out to them. And so we did more and more of that to the point now where it's part of our strategy to engage with the public. And it's not just about telling, in fact, it's not about telling, it's about informing our decision making. There's a real business case. The better our, de our, be the, our decisions are so much better if we know things. If you tell us that there's a serious concern in a particular community, and the police officers will know uh, about what to look for. We as prosecutors will know that this is very serious, even though it might be perceived as a minor offence of some kind. It's serious because of the impact it has. But we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't spoken to you about it. If you hadn't told us there was some issue in your particular uh, locale, that's something we wouldn't have picked up on. If you hadn't told us there was something your community was concerned about, that's again something we wouldn't have picked up on. So there's a real business, a strong business case for us engaging with the community. And we've now, as I said, moved from a period of not doing it at all to literally where we're, we're in your faces now. Yeah? Uh, absolutely essential that we have this discussion. You, you may have picked up, if you go to the cbs.gov.uk website, you'll see we've got guidance on this and guidance on that, all aimed at national consistency, so everybody gets the same service anywhere. And all of that guidance you put out to consultation. So we ask the public's views, we ask uh, vested interests their views, community groups, NGOs, we ask them their views so that our decisions can be so much better because we've heard what you had to say. So one example about that, in the most recent example about that, was only last week. We published our national uh, guidelines on how we deal with child sexual abuse. And uh, we, put, we, we put them out for several months to get your views. And one of the, view, the major bits of feedback we got was Nazir, can we not put in there something about myths and stereotypes? Because there are lots of myths and stereotypes that are applied to decision making. You know, if she's wearing a sort of skirt, she asks for it. You know that one? Uh, if she's been drinking, she asks for it. Yeah, over and over and over and over again. So it's really important for us to make sure that we have the, that dealt with in our guidelines so that nobody makes that stupid mistake. Nobody applies those myths and stereotypes to any decision that they have to take. 
But yeah, that was one bit, of, that's only a tiny bit of a, of a very big piece of guidance. But from my perspective, that came from you, that came from the public, that came from women's groups and NGOs who work in this field, who told us in no uncertain terms that that was an issue for them. And that's why we, 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 we're, we're better at, at rape and sexual offences. Last year we had the highest conviction rates ever of, uh, of these cases at a time when volumes were still going on. Uh, but, you know, you all know this, but in the 80s and 90s, the first question too many officers asked, and too many prosecutors asked, uh, of a victim was, did it happen? You know, you would ask, if you give me a victim of burglary, for example. If you've been burgled, a police officer won't go in there and say to you, have you been burgled? You know, the starting point would be, you tell the truth, let's work from there, let's build a case. Regrettably, around rape and sexual offences, the starting point was, she may not be telling the truth. <laughs> and that's a bad place to start. We're not there now. We're much, much more for, for, further forward, and that's why our conviction rates and our performance are so much better. But no complacency, because there are still so many instances of cases that don't that fail me. Uh, and then, you know, we've also got to recognise, have we not, the victim in all of this and the complainant in all of this, as well as the suspect. Because let's start with the suspect. The suspect is entitled to a fair trial. Never mind what the Human Rights Act says. Never mind what the ECHR says. Uh, never mind uh, what our Magna Carta says. <laughs> it's about you are entitled to a fair trial. Because if I was suspected of something, I would expect to be treated in the same way. That means I should be, that I should be dealt with swiftly, uh, that I should have access to um, legal advice, that I should have uh, all the um, disclosure, so I should know what my case, case against me is, I should know those bits of the case that the prosecution are not relying upon that are relevant, uh, so that I can make a judgment about them, uh, all of that stuff in order for me to have a fair trial. And that's my duty. As a prosecutor, it's my duty to make sure that the suspect gets a fair trial. Second thing around victims and clients is to ensure that they also get the level of support they need. And uh, in the past, we've not been as good as we should have been. So victims have never uh, you know, complained, quite rightly, that they didn't get uh, advice supporting them. They were left in the lurch so many times in the past. It's sad to say this. You know, they'd be rung up at 4 o'clock on a Monday evening saying, you're going to court tomorrow. You've got to come and give evidence tomorrow. And they said, what about my childcare? What about my, uh, you know, what about my work? You've got to be in court tomorrow. You know, no, uh, no, nothing. We don't even, didn't even worry about that. Well, that's ridiculous, and we're not there now. We moved on. But you know, I'm still seriously concerned about the level of support that we offer to victims and witnesses. And then we've got the uh, more general issue around uh, the jury pool, because the jury pool is you. you if you're over 18, you can be a member of the jury. And you will bring your prejudices and your assumptions to the courtroom. Therefore, we've got to make sure that what you hear deals with that. So, you know, we, we can't pick, and we, it's not wrong in society to pick the jury. Uh, the jury is randomly selected, but it's important they get to hear as much of the evidence as possible and are able to make a judgment on that. And so, much of our public pronouncements, when we talk about child sexual abuse, or when I talk about violence against women and girls, etc., etc., is aimed at the jury pool, to make them aware of the various challenges that we face. So that they will not apply those myths and assumptions that I talked about earlier on, myths and stereotypes. They will actually look at the evidence dispassionately and test it in the way they should do. And so we do a lot of, a lot of public pronouncements to the point where, you know, uh, you know I'm always out there. You know, I did uh, Discovery Channel last week, if you're in America on 12th of December, you'll see that. Uh, Australian Broadcasting Corporation, if you're there in America, if you're Australian 10th of November, you'll see that. Uh, ITV a couple of weeks ago, uh, and others. It's really important to get our messages out. Firstly, show that we're human and we're not bureaucrats. Secondly, what, how we apply our minds to various things, what challenges we face, uh, and what we hope society will expect from us. And I think from my perspective, uh, the media and using the media in getting those messages out is absolutely key. We also use fiction. I'm a legal advisor to EastEnders. Anyone watch EastEnders? Uh, well, I can tell you all sorts of stuff that's going to happen in Christmas and thereafter, but I can't. <laughs> so, uh, but it's important, to, from my perspective, to give them as much advice information because we often use these standards. And Lord and Lord and Order UK, do you watch that at all? I'm their advice too. And yeah, we make sure that we use the media, fiction, also to get messaging across. You know, talk about there was a really good series, a really good program about stalking that they did, for example. Because I wanted stalking to be talked about. At the end of the program, you know, here's the helpline, and dozens of people did ring up to get help and support and advice. So you can use fiction, never mind faction, and never mind real news, to get messaging out to ensure that victims uh, feel more confident about coming forward. Uh, and from my perspective, you know, any means by which we can do that 
a lawful means by which we can do that, uh, we'll make the most of uh, and use. But you know, he said it, don't listen to me. You know, I tell him what, what it's, if you don't go, come back to me after Christmas when you hear what's going to happen <laughs> and say, use. No, I didn't. I told him what it should look like. Uh, but yeah, I learned a long, long time, long, long time ago. Drama always wins out against reality. So yeah, they will do it their way, but they'll know what the um, bits and bobs of the law are. So it may look like the, the real thing, uh, even though it's absolute nonsense. Don't quote me on that. And so, um, from my perspective, it's really important to get that information out by any means necessary. And I have all my prosecutors, but not just the ones in law. I'm national lead on violence against women and girls, so it's really important for me uh, to ensure that there's best practice everywhere in the country. Uh, I'm national leader on our best violence and forced marriage. Similarly, best practice all the way across the country. I'm national leader on child sexual abuse, best practice everywhere around the country. National leader on stalking and harassment, best practice everywhere in the country. International lead on some of these subjects. So, uh, you know, some, some of our colleagues will know I've, I've been in Paris, uh, Madrid, uh, New York, talking about these subjects because it's they, want, they think we're pretty good at it. I don't think so, but they think we are. And therefore, I'm happy to share good practice with them. You know? And other jurisdictions, you know, you name it, uh, name a country, Belarus, you know, they'd be in touch, their judges would be in touch to, come, to give us some idea about what's going on and how you're doing, dealing with this particular issue or that particular issue. Any European issue, South Asian issue, South American, they're, they're desperate to talk to us. I'm very keen to share good practice and to learn. So if there's something really good that they're doing in France, if there is, uh, then I'm, I'm more than happy to, uh, to accommodate it and see whether or not we can implement it here. In Sweden, for example, uh, and I don't think this is entirely possible. In Sweden, the prosecutor prosecutes, but the victim gets their own lawyer as well, right? Now, you have to try having that conversation with the uh, Ministry of Justice uh, and see if they'll pay for two lawyers <laughs> for, uh, for any, anybody. Um, so, you know, th th there may be well be good practice in other parts of the world, but it may doesn't necessarily follow that it can be adopted, adapted here. We have to work within our constraints and our resources. But we work internationally as well. So, and I, I, you know, we have global, crime, is, crime is global. And so you have to work in other jurisdictions. You have to talk to uh, people. I dealt with a case a few years back of a murder of a young woman called Benazza Mood. She was 19 and she had kissed her boyfriend outside of a tube station. And she was killed that evening by her family for doing so. Uh, and uh, not only did I prosecute her father and her uncle successfully uh, for murdering her, she was buried in a suitcase in Birmingham, by the way. Uh, I also prosecuted a, a third man who ma murdered her after he quit. And, uh, and then the other two men ran off to Iraq. This is 2006. Now uh, you'll probably remember what happened in Iraq around uh, that time. It wasn't Saddam time anymore. Uh, there was no extradition treaty. Yet, we got them back. Lawfully, using the, you know, they used their authority, we used our authority, police to police. We got those two individuals back. The first two people extradited from Iraq, in Iraq's history, 90-year history, where the two men, two of the men that killed the war, 19-year-old Benazza Mood. See, if we're serious about it, then we'll pursue it. And it's absolutely essential, is it not? That everybody around that table who said that this girl should die, should be brought to justice for it. So five men are now serving life, and long terms of life, by a minimum tariffs for the killing of a 19-year-old girl. And that's really important for me. That sends a message out, doesn't it? Yeah. Sends a message out, don't mess. Don't do, you know, you can do all manner of things to your children, you can say all manner of things, as long as it's not against the law. You know, and there, you know, I, dealt, I mentioned uh, Stuart Hall earlier on, I dealt with the Rochdale grooming case, which you may be familiar with, because it started everything off. There was a case involving nine men in North Manchester who had been systematically uh, abusing uh, young girls, um, many of them, uh, in their uh, late, uh, mid to late teens. And before I arrived in the North West in 2008, 2009, a very cursory police investigation, which is the subject, and has been the subject of IPCC Independent Police Complaints Commission uh, review, um, and a, a prosecutor decided that that case shouldn't be prosecuted. When I arrived in 2011, I overturned that decision. And as a result, all, uh, all the men were, were convicted and now serving 19 years, 12 years, very long sentences of imprisonment uh, for what they had done. And it set off this train, which is you know, Jimmy Savile and everything else that flows from that. We set up this train that we're not dealing with child sexual abuse very well. But we've treated them very poorly. We've not listened to them, we've not believed them. How many of us have been brought up thinking uh, children be seen and not be heard? Have you heard that phrase? Why are we surprised then we didn't hear them? When they were crying and shouting and screaming that they were being abused. And most abuse takes place in the family. Yeah? Most of you take this in the family. But if they don't feel confident about coming forward and, and nobody will listen to them and nobody believe them, and particularly these figures were uh, people of some 
notoriety. Yeah, people of note, people with power. If it's power, and you know, I, I, I constantly say this, that most sexual, no, no, all sexual crime is not about sex. It's about power. You know, I, the rapist is not interested in the sex. He's interested in controlling that individual. The Bernardos call it, when it with child sexual abuse, they call it puppets on a string. You know, the child is like this. She doesn't know. In the trial, the Rossdale case, one of the girls, 15 year old girl who uh, was a victim, kept referring to one of the, uh, the defendants as her boyfriend, all the way through the trial. She'd been groomed so well that she did not see that she was being abused. And so she was, didn't think she was a victim. And you know, to the credit of the, the second police team, you know, in that particular girl's case, for example, she was so disengaged with the service, uh, with justice, uh, a police officer would turn up at her house every morning, put a DVD on for her, give her a bacon butty in order to get to, in order to, get her to court, go to court. Yeah? You need that kind of level of support sometimes with people who are so reluctant and so lacking confidence. Uh, and you know, we got them all convicted. But it led to this massive sea change. It also led to major personal consequences. And not from the Asian community, the Muslim community, uh, because people seem to assume, because they were all defendants from Muslim Pakistanis, uh, that somehow you know, they were all going to come for me. No, they didn't. They didn't. They, the reaction of the, of the Asian community who, who were in the, the perpetrators in that case was my reaction. My reaction is criminality begins and ends with a criminal. The community's not responsible. The you know, you know, when uh, Stuart Hall was dealt with, nobody said he was a white Muslim, white Christian Stuart Hall, did they? Yeah, but pretty much every time uh, one of these other guys is there, you know, Pakistani Muslims for some reason. Yeah? Um, so from our perspective, uh, it's not about the race, it's not about the ethnicity, it's not about the culture, it's all about uh, the criminal. And so the, the community was absolutely on site. In fact, they've done some fantastic work since in trying to deal with this, even though I've been hitting them on the head so many times with other cases that have been coming up, coming up since then. Um, but I got it from the far right. And why do you think I got it from the far right? Why do you think I got the abuse from the far right? I'll tell you why. Their narrative is that all Asians are the same. All us black people are the same. So when they discovered, and as everybody discovered, that the person who actually prosecuted them when others didn't was an Asian Pakistani, British Asian Pakistani, it damaged their narrative somewhat. They didn't like that. I got 1,700 letters from various people as part of their campaign. These letters went to the President Obama, uh, to the Prime Minister, uh, and several other uh, official uh, sources, all asking for me to be sacked and deported. Now, I come from Birmingham, I don't want to go back there. <laughs> right? So uh, their assumption clearly was, uh, we cannot allow this man to damage our narrative. And it, you know, and, and it wasn't just letters. Uh, for two weeks I had a police officer outside my house. Because there were various threats made and demonstrations taking place not far from where I was. And I've got small children. You know, they're little, they're not small, but 12 years old. And they were really concerned about this, obviously. And so I had to turn around with them. So I had to turn around with them and say, look, Prime Minister has a police officer outside his house too. You know? It's an esteemed thing. It's a, you know, <laughs> and it worked a treat for five seconds. But the point is, they shouldn't have to suffer because of my job. They shouldn't have had to be impacted by that way. But it doesn't, you know, I wasn't courageous. And people turned around to me and said, hey, you must be really courageous in bring this prosecution. No, the only people courageous were the victims. Because they had to stand in court, be examined, cross-examined 11 times. One girl had to be cross-examined 11 times over 10 days about her evidence. She was 16. Have you been, been cross-examined once? <laughs> 11 times. On the ninth occasion she'd been cross-examined by one of the defense barristers, she broke down and started uh, shouting at him for the question he'd asked. You know what his response was? He said, now we see the real you. Well, it took seven days and nine other barristers before the real you came out, you know? Uh, and I'm glad the judge stamped on that and said, ignore that question. That was that totally out of order, you know? Um, they have to do their job. Their job is to test the evidence. But in a case that's dealt with today, the guy who got sentenced today, you've probably read about this case, you'll read about it tonight. Uh, the case of the Asher family. The Asher family had um, brought over a young girl from Pakistan when she was 10. They claimed she was 20. She had a passport, when she, a 20 year old passport. She was uh, x rayed at uh, Heathrow, um, who was not at Heathrow, at the airport. Um, they, didn't they didn't take any note of the fact that she, she looked 10, acted 10, uh, x ray suggested 10, the passport said 20. Uh, and uh, she was then kept in a cellar for nine years. Uh, 
Uh, she was only allowed out to carry out forced labour. She was working with the family in, in, in Manchester, um, doing t-shirts. Now, what makes this worse is that uh, the uh, victim in this case uh, was deaf. Uh, she couldn't speak. Uh, she couldn't understand English. Uh, she had learning difficulties. Yet, we prosecuted that case. We provided her with an intermediary, with interpreters, everything we possibly could. A six to eight week trial lasted six to eight months. They were convicted last week. The father, the 84 year old father, was convicted of 13 rapes of this child. He today got a minimum of 13 years. That's his sentence. He's 84 years old, so we can say goodbye to him. Yeah. So, from our perspective, justice was done. But that's the kind of case, just two, three years ago, we just said it was too difficult. Because she, when she was giving evidence, just think about it, when she was giving evidence, it had to go through an intermediary who himself was deaf. Signed, she just didn't know sign language, so she, they invented a sign language. They invented, uh, she had to do it from Urdu to English to English to Urdu. Do you know, in one day, they could only ask her eight questions. Do you know how many days she gave evidence for? 34 days. Which will be, when it's finally, the count is done, the longest cross-examination of any witness in this country. But we, could, we wouldn't have done that before. Because we were thought that was too difficult. We put everything in place to make sure that she got her day in court. And do you know the good news? Two and a half years after being found in the cellar, she could speak English. As best she can. She could sign. She's a confident young woman. Not the woman in the cellar. That's what the justice system did for her. And when she was being, the, there was a retrial on some rape counts, uh, which finished last week. When uh, she was giving evidence, she didn't need half of the support we provided to her in the first trial. So we've changed her life 100% for the better. By we, I mean the police and prosecutors. You know, we, we've, got, we've took her from what she was to what she is now, and we have put to bed, literally, all of those people that, that did that to her. That's satisfying in the extreme. That's what makes me optimistic about what we can do for others. And that's why it's so important that you as lawyers, if you are lawyers, know that it's about making a difference. You know, if you want to work in company and commercial law, probate trust, Anything of that nature, good luck to you and well done. I hope you can do it because we all need those lawyers. Yeah? But I, you know, from my perspective, I've been involved in criminal justice for 20 odd years. You know, I know that I make a difference every hour, every minute, every hour. Right now, as we speak, there are two men in custody you will all read about tonight. Right? You know, I dealt with them on the way here by Blackberry when I was parked up. I wasn't driving at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> right? And you will read about them because they are big cases. Lancashire 1, Lancashire 1, Greater Manchester Police. And you know, that's why I'm satisfied doing my job. That's why I enjoy my job. That's what gives me the thrill, the buzz. But at the same time, you know, 24 7, you know, the, 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 you don't forget, sad to say this, forget 9 to 5 work. It doesn't exist anymore. It can't exist anymore because the public work in a different way. I have to, and I will happily go to events in the evening, weekends. I've worked 16 straight days, 104 hours last week. I'm sure the Working Time Directive will come knocking on my door tomorrow, you know? Uh, but it's absolutely essential that I do that. I don't see it as work. When I'm engaging with yourselves or uh, with um, various community groups or in any environment, you know, I find that absolutely thrilling for me to learn from you, to hear from you, to understand your issues or understand people's issues. And that, to my mind, makes our decisions so much better. We make some fantastic decisions, and even when they don't go right. And there's a real reason why it happens. I dealt with a case about a year ago, not name, no, 11 months ago, of a young woman um, called Frances Andrade. You may have read about it. Frances was sexually abused at uh, Chatham Music School in Manchester in the late 70s, early 80s by Michael Brewer, who uh, was subsequently um, a big celebrity as far as classical music was concerned. Um, she gave evidence against him about the abuse that she suffered a week after having do doing so, she killed herself. And all the malarkey, all the flack was all about the school system killed her. You know, I know for a fact, I wrote to the defense at uh, QC, it wasn't you, don't even take it personally. I know the press are, and media are looking for a scapegoat, it wasn't you. I said that to her, to her face. Uh, I know, because I met Francis' family a number of times, and Francis had been imp uh, impacted so much by what happened 30, 33 years ago, that she tried to kill herself pretty much every other year since then. <clears throat> and that um, she insisted 
we, we have to provide her with special measures so she can have a screen and all manner of things. She insisted on seeing her abuser in the courtroom. He was convicted afterwards. I had to, after she killed herself, the trial was still going on. I had to get the Attorney General's office to tell the press you cannot report her death until the end of this trial. You know, we can't tell them we did. <laughs> and thankfully they listened and they, they, they didn't do anything about it. Because I didn't want the jury to hear this because they might be impacted upon by, by, her, by her death. Uh, he was convicted. He got a significant prison sentence. But Francis's family told me that just because it happened 33 years ago didn't mean it didn't impact on her. And I get this quite a lot recently because I've did, I did with a substantial number of non-recent uh, abuse cases from the 70s and 80s and 60s. Uh, and people are saying to me, you know, let bygones be bygones, you yeah. know. I look at Francis's case and I think, she never, it was never a bygone for her. Why should it be a bygone for me? You know, why should it be a bygone for any of us? We've got to make sure he gets a fair trial. Absolutely. Well, they get a fair trial. But at the same time, we've got to make sure that she gets her day in court, properly supported through that process. Because just because it happened all those, time, all those years ago doesn't mean it didn't happen. And doesn't mean there are, there are consequences that she and others have to live with. You hear, there's so many phrases, aren't there? You know, time heals all wounds. You know, let me use another legal phrase, bollocks. <laughs> right? It doesn't. You know, it absolutely doesn't. You know, she was impacted every day by what happened to her. And so many of the other women I've, I've seen and dealt with uh, in terms of victims and men uh, were impacted every single day. And you know, one of the other things that, uh, that I'm yeah, upset about is the use of language as lawyers. Because we love our language, don't we? We're using language that's used to word that perhaps you wouldn't hear in a courtroom. And uh, we might do, but not from a lawyer. And from our perspective, we need to get to the language of the people. We hide so much, you know, we've obviously we've moved some distance from where we apply for leave all the time. Now we apply for permission. You know. could, you just, could you just give me something? You know, why can't we use the language that the public understand? From next week, the Supreme Court is being filmed. Did you know that? Sorry, the Court of Appeal sentencing is now going to be filmed. You'll be able to see on TV, if you want to, uh, a Crown Court hearing for appeal hearing on television. And we're moving more and more and more. By the time you're all fully qualified and operating, I, it would not surprise me if you have a television camera in your courtroom. <clears throat> that might scare you. It might be a course you might need to run uh, in addition to all the other modules that you run. <clears throat> but I have no doubt that's the direction of travel because the public want it. This, these are our courts. This is what we spend our money on. Therefore, we should have access. Just because I can't make it into Sheffield Crown Court you know, with the 14 seats at the back, doesn't mean that I should not be able to see what happens. And so from my perspective and our perspective, get ready for that. Uh, and you know, it's really important that we make the, the leap of being part of the public. My children, about six months ago, when you know, there was a big hoo-ha, which it continues to be, about trolling. You know, you're being trolled. You know, it's an online uh, bullying, online abuse. And my, one of my sons said to me, Dad, we don't call it that, we call it ogring. And I said, really? And I did a Google, nobody calls it ogring, the kids do. Yeah? On their sites, they call it ogre. We've got to stay in touch. Otherwise, we're out of date. If we're out of date, we're useless. Yeah? And so, uh, from, a, from a legal perspective, you've got to remain engaged. And you've got to remain, this is the value of talking to people, whoever they are, is that they will tell you something you didn't know. And then maybe you can act upon it, maybe you can share it, and maybe you can do something about it. So, from my perspective, you know, um, I don't know where we're going. What's that? What's that? Okay, five more minutes. Um, from my perspective, my job is about seeing justice done, absolutely. Making sure that, as I said to you, the suspect gets all the rights uh, that, that he or she, she deserves. At the same time, making sure the victim uh, is properly supported through this process. Uh, but I'm also here to prevent it happening in the first place. This is the bit I maybe don't get when you hear the words Crown Prosecution Service. I spend a sizable amount of my time working in prevention work. And that might be working with NGOs and voluntary groups. I talked about honor-based violence and forced marriage. I started talking about that 10 years ago when it wasn't really anybody's subject. Uh, as a result of that, the 2007 Forced Marriage Act is in place now. Next summer, next spring, forced marriage will, be criminal, will become a criminal offence. Uh, every department, uh, by that means health, health um, housing, education, now have minimum standards to deal with forced marriage. There is now a national hotline for victims and survivors. Didn't exist. But you know, through working with the NGOs and, and survivors and others, we've been able to put those things in place to put us in a really good place where, in fact, as far as the UN is concerned, we now lead the world 
and the way we tackle one of those violence and force managers. Prevention. Do you know what I mean? Prevention is also about education. So I, I remember, um, I give evidence to Parliament quite a bit. The last time I did, well, it's time before last, I talked about missing children in education. You may appreciate this more than most, but there are children who go missing every summer and never come back. And you know, I said to the parliamentarians at the select committee, you know, do you know how many? They said, uh, tell us. I said, I don't know, what are you asking me for? You know, you should know as parliamentarians. And suddenly they decided to do a straw of the country and found hundreds and hundreds of children have just gone missing. It wouldn't happen if you were a white Christian, I suspect. You know, people say this, really. But it, because it, it happens in certain communities and only in certain communities, perhaps more so than others, people were not asking the question they should have been asking. And you know, we've now put in place all manner of strategies to deal with this type of criminality that didn't exist before. Uh, and the same thing can be true, uh, same thing is true of child sexual abuse, the same thing is true of, uh, of pretty much violence against women and girls across the board. Uh, and some you know, stalking and harassment. Four years ago, I remember victims coming up to me and saying, you're not taking it seriously. You don't realize the imp impact it has on us. You know, one young lady told me that her music career was completely dead in the water because people, because somebody pretended to be her to abuse Cardi Minogue. I didn't realize this. Somebody had a her identity, abused Kylie Minogue, all Kylie Minogue's fans then went on to attack her, she had to go offline, end of her career. You know? And she said, stalking, nobody takes it seriously, so we listened. So uh, the Association Chief Police Officer and myself sat down, and you know, November last year, stalking became a criminal offence, do you know that? See what you can achieve if you learn, if you understand there is a problem in the first place. I didn't know there was a problem until somebody told me there was a problem. And then you can press some buttons and hopefully somebody will listen to you and something will make it happen. So from my perspective, the law is not the, is the, not the be all and end all. The law exists anyway. I'm glad it's there and we can use it as a tool. But ultimately it's the individual within the system that work. And how they work and how they interact and what they know and how they, you know, so many of my, um, so many of the lawyers I interact with, you know, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to talk to them <laughs> much. Because they don't, they don't use a, a simple language. They, they, there's a sense of arrogance among some of them which, which worries me. I hope you, it's not in your blood, it's certainly in some people's DNA. <clears throat> and um, I know that they don't even know how to shake hands. Yeah? And from my perspective, these are the kinds of things that we can train ourselves from an early age, an early stage. You know, I did, I'm, I'm a pro-chancellor of another university. I did 710 degrees, hand up 710 degrees in, at a university in July. I kid you not, I was shaking jelly most of the time. <laughs> yeah? And they were looking everywhere but me. You know? And you know, simple things, and from an employer's point of view, and I employ you know, several hundred people, I need, these are basic skills I want from you, but the public needs them from you, interact with them, talk to them, you are the public, you are the community. And you know, when somebody says to me, why should I do this, and I guess some people do this, you are part of that community, these are your neighbours, you know, these are people you can work with and live with, and do live with. Therefore it's important that you engage with them in a way that perhaps you haven't done before. Don't get aloof, don't think you're in some RV tower because you ain't. Yeah? Uh, and they'll just take the proverbial if you, if, you, if you do say that and do say things of that nature. And so from my perspective, we can make a big difference. And prosecutors do make a difference, lawyers make a difference. You know, I've worked with my whole, whole legal community in the northwest of England, Law Society and others, the Bar Council and others. It's tough out there. Seriously tough out there. But unless you have passion, commitment, enthusiasm, you know, I use that with those faces all the time because they don't cost anything. You know? I ask for, and it doesn't cost anything. But I want that. Because if you've got that, it will literally, through osmosis, filter through everybody in the system. And some of my best days haven't been the outcome. I'm not interested, as Minister of Justice, I'm not interested in the outcome, guilty or otherwise, as long as we've done a good job. You know? If we've done a good job, but my, my best days are when a victim or a complainant or somebody comes up, comes up to me and says, you should do a good job today. That's what you should be striving for. Thank you. I'll stop there. We've got about 10 minutes, if there's any, uh, 10 minutes? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> I think any questions anybody would like to ask? Right, let's tell you to silence. <laughs> oh, right. Good to see you. Okay. <laughs> you mentioned at the beginning that during your career within... Oh, oh, thank you. Hello. Hello. Yeah? Cool. You mentioned um, at the beginning that within your career, it, within criminal law, you've also done some uh, defence work, and I wondered why you had gone into that and then why you come back to prosecution okay. and what keeps you there? Well, uh, easy, it was easy from my perspective and it's a personal decision. I mean, I have a lot of defense, a lot of lawyers who work in defense work and uh, tremendous respect for them. You know, I married one <laughs> several years ago. And so from my perspective, it's not something that I'm totally concerned about at all. For me personally, 
the way I describe it was uh, describe it this way. I think as a prosecutor, what I'm doing, or my prosecutor is doing, is building a wall. This wall is the is the evidence, right? Uh, which is more satisfying, building a wall, or as a defence advocate looking for the hole so it can come <laughs> crashing down? Yeah? I would prefer I would prefer to build, and that's my own personal choice. But as I said to you, we, we, it, it, yes, I remember giving a, a, a talk with a, um, a group on one end in London a few, a few years ago, and they said, "Now let's hear from the dark side." <laughs> before I before I started talking, it was all about kind of terrorism work. Uh, terrorism work. And uh, I said, I'm not from the dark side. We're on the same side, aren't we? Don't you want your community safer? Yeah? Are you, are you saying these individuals are, are representative of your community? No. So, from my perspective, uh, it's, it's a personal choice. It's one I found, uh, more, I find it more fulfilling, but at the same time, I have tremendous respect for those who work in the defense community. Yes? Mm -hmm. Or forever hold your peace. Gentlemen, there. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, there's been a lot of uh, changes to legal aid uh, recently, and I know it's largely affected the civil uh, side, but I wonder, has there been any impact you've seen, or any that you can see uh, in the way it affects your work? Yeah, well, from a, obviously, we, we get a, a budget anyway. Uh, we get a budget which has been from government, which has been reduced by 27% uh, since 2010. I have had to let go of, uh, I don't know, 120 staff just in the northwest of England, and I would have to let go of some more early in the new year. But, and it's a big but, crime's going down. I find it very difficult in terms of a business case to go to the Treasury and say, give me the same amount of money when I'm dealing with less work. Uh, the other thing to be said about that, because uh, is a lot more of the police work is being dealt with through restorative justice and non-prosecution work. So yes, I might be seeing less work, but I've got 27% less uh, money already. Uh, and there has to be something said, and one of the government's arguments is about level playing field. They're saying if the state prosecution service is 27% less, then the state should be paying 27% less in legal aid. Because surely it should be quality of arms, if you really believe in the quality of arms. Now, I know firms of the solicitors that are finding it very difficult uh, to cope. I'm finding it junior bar are struggling. Uh, I know that. Um, but these are, these, are, these are challenging times. It's not going to get any easier. You know, we, can, you know, the old, we can't be like Canute and stand there and stop the waves from coming in. It never worked for him, did it? So from my perspective, we need to be cleverer. And one of the things we're doing, in terms of cleverer, is digital work. You know, if you go, and you, you will see, before, before you qualify, so before 2016 or thereabouts, every criminal courtroom in the country will be totally digital. So the idea that you'll be walking in with your red ribbon and white ribbon, unless you want to write a tablet device, uh, <laughs> is, is a nonsense. Now, digital working provides us with tremendous opportunities. It's safe, safe it's efficient, uh, it's secure. You know, if the police send it to us electronically, we make sure that what you get, what the defense gets is electronically sent, the judge then gets it electronically. Everything's in place. So the biggest change, never mind the money that's uh, being reduced, from 2015, all legal aid contract will require defense solicitors require solicitors to work digitally. Two years away, less than. Right? Now, to my mind, it doesn't matter that um, uh, you know, I can't stop the money from going, uh, but I have, what I've done, and I, I speak for my own uh, area, is I've actually resourced the things that matter. So I've put more people into child sexual abuse, more people into violence against women and girls, uh, and some of the other things have, have, have reduced resources. But you know, we can do it better, we can be more efficient, uh, and we don't have to lose it. And I think I think the buyers and others are having to come to terms with that, uh, but perhaps it's going to be a bit more pain than, we, than we've uh, imagined thus far. Anybody else? Good to hear. <laughs> oh, do, do you think your, your own ethnicity makes it um, you're more effective and better to be able to confront some of the issues about um, honour based violence or forced marriage? No, but people again make assumptions. I mean, not you. Not me, but back in 2004, when I, first, I, ran, I organized the first national conference on our base violence force marriage, the first thing I got from, I got, 30, I got 31 media interviews that day, and various channels were saying to me, uh, is it because it's you're Asian that you're based in this? No, it never, it never touched me. I'm not a woman for a start. Most, most victims are forced, I'm certainly not, right? most victims <laughs> are forced marriage are women, right? So it never impacted on me. You know, my, I'm a good Muslim boy that married a Catholic, followed by a Hindu, followed by a Sikh. 
I've done my bit for motivating it. So none of these things led to me being killed, harmed, or whatever it is. So it never, it never, it never was. It was all a case of victims and survivors coming to me and saying, um, "This is an issue," and me learning about the issue. Uh, whether or not that had, from a perception point of view, you know, if I go to a place of worship or uh, to a community meeting. Will they open the door to me in a way they wouldn't do? Yes, I may, maybe that's true. I remember the command, uh, a, a Metropolitan Police commander said to me, he said, will you come with me to this place of worship? Uh, and I said, I'm busy. He said, I'm busy. <laughs> and it was literally, he felt more confident if I was there, uh, that they would listen to him if I was there. And I said, absolutely fine. Yeah, as long as people are honest about that. But that's a perception thing. The reality, though, from my perspective is, you know, I t I've tackled crimes in all communities. You know, I, I, I don't uh, wear my colour or favour, whatever it is, on my sleeve. It is what it is. Uh, and I hope that um, you know, I can pick up and learn about any issue. Uh, I talk to the traveller community about forced marriage, for example. Because you know, I have a perception that there is some forced marriage. I watched uh, big, my big fat gypsy. <laughs> you know, uh, perception certainly about early, early marriage, if not forced. And uh, nobody said to me that you're only doing that because you're a traveller. I'm not traveller. Yeah? But the assumptions are made about the fact that you need that lever, so to speak. I hope that's not true. But from my perspective, it wasn't something that I specific, specifically set out to do. You just foresee, though, that um, on a base violence, being on base violence and, and, and such issues are, are largely directed at Asian men. Yeah. And, and so for, for to be a white British person that's leading on that, it could seem almost, almost as if... Well, if people say that about grooming as well, you know, that some of the group grooming, for example, uh, size of proportions of it, maybe half, I think, that are dealt with are Asian men, and people, are, again, assume that this was it. You know, I dealt with Stuart Hall, I dealt with Cyril Smith, you know, I did the report on Cyril Smith last year. Uh, you know, the people you're going to read about today, you know, these are all people who are not in that phase or anything. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I take your point, but, you know, the most, uh, could you not, and this is true, the most recent forced marriage case that I became aware of involved a 16-year-old white Catholic girl uh, who was um, being forced into marriage because she was pregnant by her 17-year-old white Catholic uh, boyfriend. Uh, parents said that uh, if she didn't get married, the child would be damned in hell. Right? Uh, and I dealt with a case in ERA, uh, the Irish Republic, they contacted me about a case involved there. The Brazilians are being in touch, Eastern Europeans are being in touch. It, it, whilst you know, in this country, two-thirds of forced marriages take place in the Muslim community, two-thirds of minorities in this country are Muslim. So, yeah, proportionately, that's what's happening. But, you know, if the moment we start saying it's a X problem, a victim that isn't part of X will feel excluded and won't feel confident about coming forward. So, you know, I always try my best to disabuse people that it's a one community issue because I know for a fact it isn't. Anybody else? Can I be on my way then? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for your time. <laughs>